Hello everyone. So today's video, um, I'm going to be talking about how to set up an altar and the things that you can put on the altar. So um, first question you have to ask yourself is where? Are you going to put it in your bedroom? Are you going to have a room all to itself, like an altar room? Um, excuse me, if you don't have that kind of space, you can put it in the corner of your bedroom, maybe up in the attic if you have the space, if it's doable. Um, the thing about attics that I will tell you, a little tip, attics tend to get really hot in the summertime. So if you have an altar up there, your candles will get soft and they will melt. Some of them, the smaller candles will actually melt. The bigger candles will get really soft and they're just not, not workable. They just too soft and, and pliable and it's just it gets messy <laughs> so I've had my altar in the attic before and I decided not to do it in the attic for that reason but if you have um, an attic where you have like a cooling system or something like that then it would be doable for you so um, next question do you want to do it uh, surface do you have a dresser that you'd like to do it on do you have a um, a table an end table um, do you have a, you want to make it a portable um, altar that you can take with you different places, a nightstand, um, do you have animals and children? If so, make this part of your process of where you'd like to put your altar. Cats are tricky little beings. They're just, they're magical creatures that I just love so dearly, but they are attracted to places of magic. I tell you, I kid you not, and they like to be up high. So if you have something that is just high enough for them to get on, they will get on it. And so if you have all of this beautiful stuff on your altar, but your cat keeps going up there, your cat doesn't understand that, you know, it can't knock that off. <laughs> or it can't, you know, when it lays down, it just kind of pushes everything away. So being mindful if you have young children, um, even older children, making it, making sure that they understand they can't touch it. Young children don't understand that they can't touch it. They're going to ask why. The second you tell them they can't touch it, they're going to try to touch it. So making it high enough that they cannot reach it. Um, if you have, again, if you have animals, you have dogs, making sure that it's just high enough that they can't get on top of it or reach it or eat anything on it. Um, same thing for cats. Um, if you have cats and you just don't have anything high enough, thinking about maybe having a portable altar might be the option that's good for you. Setting up your altar when you're using it, taking it back down when you're done. You can still have a dedicated um, surface for it. If you still want to use your dresser or you want to use your nightstand as your altar, just setting up and taking down when you're done using it. Um, which way should the altar face? Now, everybody has their own opinions on this and you can go completely by how you feel. Um, some people have their altar facing north, other people have altar, their altar facing east, because that's where the sun rises. Does it matter? I'm going to say no, because I truly firmly believe that everybody should follow their own gut feeling on how they should, uh, how they, how they should practice and where they should set up their altar. If you have something that, um, your dresser, for instance, let's say if it's facing east and you really like that location, then your altar is going to face east. And, you know, if you have a location that you want, but it's facing north, then it's going to face north. And, you know, I think that everybody should just use their own intuition when setting up their altar. There, sh there should never be, you have to set it up this way. No, I don't like when people do that. And, you know, I don't like when, when people say you have to do one thing or another. Do what feels right to you, period. That's it. Um, I have my altar facing east, but I prefer it that way. That's my preference. Um, so once you've decided on the above, um, you know, the, where you're going to put it and, you know, which direction and, you know, how high, low, whatever, um, what goes on the altar? Um, these are just suggestions. These are just the tools of the craft. These are just ritual tools and things like that. None of these things have to be on the altar. Take what you want and put it on. I'm going to tell you something that I want to say it really quickly. But I want to say it with importance. The only tool that you need to practice the craft, the only tool is you. You do not need an altar. 
You do not need candles. You do not need a cauldron. You do not need a chalice. You do not need any of these things. You truly only need yourself. We are the most powerful tool in witchcraft. The most powerful tool. So you do not need anything specific. Uh, specific. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth. Um, so these are just suggestions and these are just telling you about the tools that, you know, some people put on their altars, um, merely suggestions. So let's get started. Um, number one is the altar cloth. I am going to show you from my altar, um, that way you have an idea of what goes on, what they look like and not all looks the same. So I have this altar cloth. I follow the Egyptian path. Um, so I have an altar cloth. This opens up nice and big. But this is an Egyptian themed altar cloth. And so I put this on my altar. Now I also have other altar cloths. This goes on my altar when I do um, my moon rituals, whether it be the new moon or the full moon. This altar cloth goes on when I do my spell work. This altar cloth goes on when I do my uh, deity honor ritual. Um, however, during Sabbaths, I change the altar cloth. Uh, I change the altar cloth, different co I have a whole bunch of different colored altar cloths that I do for each Sabbath. So that that's what an altar cloth is. It's the cloth that lays across. Um, you can have one all-purpose cloth or a number of altar cloths for different purposes, Sabbaths, color appropriate for the ritual or spell. You can have as many as you want. You can have just one. You can have none. It's up to you. Um, element direction representations. Um, these can be colored candles, blue for water, yellow for air, green for earth, red for fire. Um, it can also be a bowl of salt or dirt for earth, incense for air, seashell for water, and candle for fire. You can even point, uh, paint little stones, um, the symbols of each element, and place them at each direction. So I'm going to show you what I use. Um, <clears throat> I have, I bought these little wooden circles at Walmart. They were, for a package of four, it was like 98 cents. So this is my fire. It goes like this, actually. That's my fire. And I have the candle that sits on top of it. And when I invoke each element, I light each candle. So I have that for, the red is for fire. I have the blue for water. I have the brown and the green for earth and for air I have the yellow and the yellow candle so that's what I use for my element and direction um, representations the chalice this is a sacred cup that holds wine during ritual I don't put wine I don't use wine um, I use juice you can use any liquid that you want. You can use uh, beverages in association with the season. So let's say if you're doing a Yule ritual, you can use uh, apple cider if you choose. You can do eggnog. You can do whatever you want in association. You can use whatever beverage you want. You want to use a beer? Use a beer. You want to do wine, juice, water? Don't matter. So this is a chalice. And this is the chalice that I use. And I actually went to a thrift store and I purchased this bad boy for it was like I don't know a dollar fifty and I got it I brought it home I, I uh, cleaned it physically and I cleansed it spiritually and, and I've had it ever since so this is what a chalice looks like it doesn't have to be this tall it can be shorter it could be larger if you want it could be like more goblet looking um, that's up to you the cauldron this represents the womb and is a symbol of femininity. And you can burn things in your cauldron. It can hold water. You can even make potions and mixtures in your cauldron. Long ago, witches would travel long distances for great sabbats and would bring their cauldron and a variety of like fowl, so ducks, chickens, geese, things like that. <clears throat> and on their stops along the way, they would gather water from the rivers and uh, or, or streams and they would cook these birds as they would go um, for food. So obviously my cauldron is not big enough to cook a goose, nor would I cook a goose in it. But So this is my cauldron, and this is what I use for, um, I actually have some stuff in it right now. I don't know if you can, you can see. But I always keep a, I, when I burn things in here, I leave the ash inside. 
because I collect the ash and number one the ash provides a um, it's like it absorbs the heat so when you're burning things in there you can also put sand in the bottom if you want um, or even salt but um, I collect the ash when I'm done and I make black salt for protection so like anything that you're burning in there you can actually take out and make mix it with regular salt and make a black salt for protection um, crystals I've shown you crystals before I'll just take a couple off the side here you can leave crystals on your altar um, so this is a garden quartz I leave this on my altar as well so this is for chakra work this is all the chakra stone and all the stones associated with all the chakras I leave this on my altar and I work with them altar decorations for each Sabbath so I don't have anything up right now so there's nothing really for me to show you um, as far as decorations but when May bond comes I am going to put um, pine cones I am going to put um, fall leaves May bond is approaching it, it's the first day of fall um, so um, you can put your altar decorations and that's depending on what the Sabbath is what the season is so as I said I'll put pine cones I'll put um, fallen leaves from the trees um, I might even do like a like they have it at like the stores the the vines that have like the leaves maybe do like a wreath something like that so you can do um, decorations according to each Sabbath divination tools so you can have your black scrying mirror you can have your Oracle cards you can have um, a crystal ball you can have any of these divination tools on your altar um, incense and sensor now I do not have a sensor a sensor is something that has a stand and it has like this little hook and it's this it can be any color but it's like this a bowl and then it has these like a, a top and it hangs by a chain and so you heat you know your little charcoal disc and you put your your herbs or resin or whatever you want on it and you bring it around your room and it disperses the smoke um, I use incense so I have just a regular incense holder I use I use the cat one because as I said I follow the Egyptian way and for me this is a representation of boss so I use the cat um, but then I just put an incense stick in there every once in a while I will use my cauldron and I will light one or two charcoal disc and put it in the bottom and I'll sprinkle some herbs on there if I need to do a deep clean like if I'm cleansing my altar area I will use the cauldron I'll light charcoal disc put sage on it and I will uh, move the smoke around my altar deity statues and representations this I think that people get so hung up on spending all of this money I do have statues okay but you don't need them and so I honor Isis so this is Isis a lot of people see her with the wings I liked her with the representation of the shield so I got her with the shield and these are my this is my main two that I work with all the time so I work with boss and, and stuff but Isis and Osiris are my main deity so I also have Osiris but what I also have and what I I like to tell people to do because statues can be expensive and you know if you don't have 40 to 50 to 80 dollars a pop for each statue what you can do there's this thing I think it's called like popo if you go on Amazon and you go on popo and you search up well number one do you research with them like for instance you know Osiris is associated with crocodiles you can go on and look popo crocodile and on Amazon it'll pop up like this little it's an educational toy okay it's supposed to be made for children it is it'll be a crocodile that is made to look exactly like like a real croc. it doesn't look like a toy it looks like a little replica of a crocodile and you can have that and those things cost like five bucks and you can have that on the altar instead of a statue and you're saving yourself anywhere from you know 35 to 75 bucks and not buying a statue you don't even have to put anything on there you can you don't have to you can leave them offerings you don't have to put a representation if you don't want to they they live here they don't live on the altar they live you know everywhere else they visit the altar 
So, and essentially, an altar is like a it's like a home for them, you know. But they don't live there. They they don't, you know. It's like a space for them to feel like home, to, you know, to be inviting for them to to visit. Anyway, I, I get on tangents, and this is this is what happens. <laughs> So you can get the representations instead if you choose and save a shit ton of money. So I always put that recommendation out there because I know that not everybody's, you know, has a lot of cash, especially, or a lot of money for that matter, especially in this time that we are in, you know, the year 2020, the year from what the fuck happened. <laughs> so, you know, maybe doing like, you know, the representations instead, you save yourself a bunch of money. Deity candles. I use little candles. So I have just this little, you can turn it over if you want to. There's a space here, you can turn it over this way. I use it this way. It has a, a wider base. I like that. I feel like it's not gonna topple like with it being this way, especially when you're messing around with candles and it's lit, you can't, you can't take that chance. So I turn it this way. And like, this is my goddess candle and it fits on perfect. You know, it's kind of, I, this is one thing I hate buying candles online because it's like they come to you and they're so jacked, but it is what it is. So anyway, so I use my silver candle for my goddess and I use a go uh, gold candle for the god. The wand is associated with both air and fire and it is a tool for directing energy. So I have two. I'll just show you real quick. What, they can look like anything. Okay, this is one that I got and then this is another that I got some wands are just sticks they're literally they're, they don't have to be designed a certain way they're literally just sticks from a tree that they're you know they're carved down um, and they're you know maybe you add like a shellac or, or some kind of like sealing treatment to them you can add a crystal at the end if you choose um, it doesn't have to be fancy. It'd be literally thanking the tree for its, you know, it's giving you this gift of it. Finding one on the ground. You don't even have to like pick it off the tree. Finding a, a stick that's on the ground already and making that into your wand. It could be really as simple as that. And it's coming directly from nature. Um, the athame. The athame is a knife with a straight double-edged blade, usually with a black handle. And although in some traditions, symbols are etched into the handle, uh, that's not English. I don't know what I wrote there. <laughs> that is associated with a particular tradition. This tool works with energy and directs energy, works much like a wand. Um, it is not used for physical cutting. It is used to cast a circle for evocation, for invocation, for cutting a door in your circle if you need to step out, and used during libation to represent the god and goddess becoming one. So this is my athame. And as you can see, it is it has two edges. So it has an edge here and it has an edge here. It is a double-edged knife. So this is my athame that I use um, on my altar. Um, let's see. The bowline is next. The bowline is a small knife with a curved blade used for cutting herbs. Not to be confused with a white handled knife used to inscribe other craft tools. So this is my bowline and when I go out and I cut my herbs and stuff like that I use this. So it's like a harvesting tool. I always get, it closes. And I'm like, one of these days, it's gonna harvest more than some herbs. It's gonna take a finger. <laughs> so the white handled knife um, can be single or double edged, used for making, marking, and inscribing other tools. I'm gonna tell you that I don't use a white handled knife. I literally went to the store and they had these little mini um, kitchen knives. They were like mini, mini. And they, I don't even know what you could have possibly used these things for, but they were like little things and I bought a pack of them and I used those to inscribe my tools, uh, my candles with sigils and things like that. I don't, I never ended up buying a white handled knife. You don't have to buy anything on this list. The besom is a bundle of sticks or twigs or can be a straw broom. Uh, traditionally made of 
uh, broom, heather, or birch. It is used to cleanse an area energetically, push out all the bad and stagnant energy. As you can see, I have two back there. I have two of those besoms, and I also have a straw one as well that's hidden behind my crystal case. Um, bowls of water and salt used to cleanse the sacred space. So I do have both. So I have my I have my bowl of water that I keep. I always keep it covered because I want it to remain clean. Um, and as I said, I have cats, so they'll drink it if, if I leave it open. And then I have my, my bowl of salt as well. And again, I keep it covered. Salt can kill your cat. Um, if, they, if you leave it open and the cat sticks his face in, salt is extremely dehydrating. And, you know, uh, you have to be very careful with animals because if they eat enough of it, and if they don't even have to eat a lot of it, that's the thing. If they eating enough of it doesn't even mean a lot. They just need that, that little bit to get in their system to, to dehydrate them. It, it can be deadly to cats. So if you have a bowl of salt on your altar, please make sure that it is covered. If you have animals. <clears throat> or kids. Or kids will eat anything. I mean, even for kids, you might want to put the cover on. Um, be sure to cleanse and consecrate your tools before use. So um, these are the basics of having an altar. There are other things that you can put on an altar as well, but I just feel like those are, you know, I wanted to cover the basics. That's Oh, and also your Book of Shadows. That, that's another thing. I'm going to go over in another video, Book of Shadows versus Grimoires, um, because there's a lot of confusion as to what they are, like what's the difference between the two. Um, but I don't keep my Book of Shadows on my altar. I have a shelf, right? Actually, right behind my computer. Um, where I keep my uh, book of shadows and I leave it there because I sit here a lot and I sit here at my desk and I write my own rituals and I write my own spells and I like to have my book of shadows right there. That way if I'm writing rituals, I can take out an old ritual, pop a new one in or whatever. Cause I, I about three or four times a year, I go through my book of shadows and you know, whatever I feel like doesn't connect with me anymore. I, I write a new one. So, um, I hope that this was helpful and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.